When looking at copper oxide, one of the tests that you could perform is to look at the ratio of the copper 2P against the oxygen 1S. And if properly quantified in using relative sensitivity factors, transmission, etc., you might expect the atomic concentration to give an indication of the amount of each one of these substances. So in this case, we're looking at a material where it's slightly favoring the copper, but roughly about the same. Now, another way to look at this is to go to a, a standard material, something that is known to be copper 2 plus, and see what kind of results we get from performing the same analysis for the oxygen and the, co and the copper 2P. And here is an example where you can see that, in fact, this is very, very close indeed. This is one to one. So this is the copper 2 plus, at least this is what the these results would suggest. And when we look at the data for the copper 2P in high resolution, you can see that the, there's a very characteristic structure here. So similarly, if we look at a, a standard material for a copper 1 plus, uh, then we have again a doublet here, very characteristic and very different from the 2 plus. And looking at the ratio of these these regions, and we're applying the same background and same sensitivity factors, etc. So we're trying to do a fair test. And you can see here that the copper is much more than the oxygen, and it's about 2 to 1. So this is the copper 1 plus, and that's consistent with what the sample was. So it's reasonable to go back to our data and think to ourselves that we might have a predominantly copper 2 plus with a bit of copper 1 plus. However, if you look at the copper 2P in more detail, it's quite clear that there's a sharp peak here, and the loss structure and the and the broader peak that would be associated with the 2 plus state is uh, suggesting that the results we're getting from the survey spectrum are somewhat wrong. We need to do some further analysis of this high resolution spectrum to try and understand what the actual oxidation state is for these data. So let me just click on that and let's find the VAMAS block. And there it is. So what I want to do is do a bit of processing here. Let me just verify that I've got the same one. So I'll put up the use ID tag. That'll put the sample identifier in with the header. So we can see that it is the same one. And let me just go back to the original display. And we can see here that I'll put the identifier on here again and pull it out so we can see it. And yes, that's the one that we're interested in. So back to the second view of this data file and what I've done previously is I've prepared within the element library some standard line shapes that have been derived previously and they've been saved in a directory that when I select the open line shape and this is the directory that you can see it's in the casa xbs.lib line shapes directory and I've prepared a file which when I select and I open loads into the current session a set of line shapes that have been derived from data so these are the line shapes so if I wanted to zoom in I can have a quick look at what that line shape looks like and this has been derived as I say from data so the first thing we need to do is understand what background was used for these data and the background is a U2 two guard background and the parameter that is important a U2 two guard background is this one here so I need to make sure I'm using the same when I create a peak model for the the data that I want to analyze so I create a background let's 
just give it a little bit more stability and what we can do is create a peak model based on these line shapes and the first thing I've done is I've created a peak and it's brought in a line shape but it's not the one from the library so I want to hold the control key down and click before it's an edit field and this shows me all the line shapes that have just been loaded from the library file so the first one I'm going to put in is going to be the one plus and I'll just say fit to that and you can already see that it one plus is a significant part of these data and when I create the second one again I need to add and this is going to be the two plus oxide and then I want one more because there's another option which was a two plus hydroxide so we've now got line shapes uh, that will give us a chance of fitting these data as you can see the line shapes fit these data quite nicely if I show you the components table on the annotation we can now see and let's label these correctly so that was the one plus Cu2O this was the copper oxide CuO 2 plus and then we have a 2 plus hydroxide I'll just delete this and we'll remove some of the unnecessary information and I'll also increase change the font so you can now see that the annotation table is showing us that we've got Cu2O and we've got also hydroxide and they're close in their amount and we've also got this 2 plus so this it should be one to one for oxygen but the fact that we've got Cu2, so we've got two copper to one oxygen, and then here we've got two oxygen to one copper, and hence these two are cancelling each other out, so we get about the same amount of copper to oxygen as you saw in the survey spectrum. Hence, you had to do the peak fit to really understand the, the oxidation states and the materials that might make up this this particular sample